Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer envisions a world that embraces love as a guiding principle and animating force for our lives, a powerful love that helps us live in sacred relationship with ourselves, others, and the natural world. Learn more by visiting Fetzer.org. The focus of our national fight over abortion may change, but this hasn't changed for decades. We collapse this most intimate and complex of human dilemmas to two sides. I have been looking yet again for wisdom away from the turbulent news cycle, and I keep returning to a conversation I had in 2011 with Frances Kissling, who is a bridge person in the abortion debate. She's controversial on both sides, but speaking from a place that many of us would like to map out between the poles. She has sought to come into relationship with her political opposites. She's experienced something more powerful, as she tells it, than defining common ground. And this has lessons for other issues in our common life and all our struggles with people with whom we disagree the most. The need to approach others with enthusiasm for difference is absolutely critical to any change. You know, like, I'm the toughest of fighters. And, you know, and I love a good fight, and I love to win. But I think what I have learned is that you have got to approach differences with this notion that there is good in the other. And that if we can't figure out how to do that, and if there isn't the crack in the middle where there are some people on both sides who absolutely refuse to see the other as evil, this is going to continue. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Frances Kissling is president of the Center for Health, Ethics, and Social Policy, but she's perhaps best known as the president of Catholics for Choice, a post she held from 1982 to 2007. She was raised by her Polish-American mother, who came from a coal mining town in Pennsylvania. And while a very young woman, Frances Kissling spent a short time in a convent. So how did you then end up becoming a nun at the age of 19? I mean, how did that happen? Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, I did go to Catholic schools. Mm-hmm. Um, when you grow up in a, a working class uh, Catholic family, uh, with most of your models in life being working class, and a mother who had uh, two bad marriages, um, the life of a nun looks pretty good in many ways. So I, I saw religious life as a way of uh, really doing good. And nuns were the smartest, kindest, although some of them were pretty mean, but they right. varied from the meanest to the kindest uh, people I knew. Mm-hmm. Um, I had some ideas about Catholicism that were different from most Catholics, even as a young girl, in the sense that, you know, I didn't think divorce was the worst thing in the world, and I didn't see any reason why people um, shouldn't get remarried. And I certainly didn't think my mother was going to hell or was an adulteress. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I thought that people like me needed to be active in the church, you know, that that it was that, that period where things were beginning to change. And so that really, attra- I think that was part of my attraction to religious life, the feeling that I had something to offer that might be a little bit different. And you were just there, what, a year? Is that right? I mean, yeah, it was a pretty under a year. short-lived. Yes. So... Um, As a friend of mine who was a mother superior often says, uh, definitely a chicken. <laughs> okay. Um, and I wonder, you know, I'm just, I, I, I'm trying to see the the trajectory of uh, the things you, you care about and you came to care about. And you, you've you written and said to others that you were never deeply interested in having children or imagining right. yourself as, as having a lifelong marriage. And yet, at a pretty young age, this issue of abortion became, you became very passionate about this and an, and an activist on this. Um, uh-huh. And so, you know, we're... Where did that originate in in all of that? Well, it actually wasn't, I would say it wasn't at that young an age because I became involved in, I never thought about abortion. Um, You know, I often say that, you know, when you you grew up before abortion was a political issue, Mm. um, it was never mentioned. Abortion was not something that came up in um, Catholic schools in the 50s and even into the 60s. It really became a political, theopolitical issue 
after Roe v. Wade. And so I really had almost no exposure to abortion whatsoever. I, I think that for me, the starting point was, as a younger woman, was sexuality um, in the sense that, first of all, I had a mother who had a, a sexual life that was condemned by the church. Mm-hmm. Um, I myself, because I had, had no seeming interest in marriage and had no desire to have children, But in my early years, in my 20s, after I left the convent and left Catholic school and moved to Greenwich Village and went to the New School for Social Research and Mm -hmm. became active against the war in Vietnam, um, you know, my thought was that, you know, really, I I really didn't think God intended me to never have sex just because I didn't get married. And this was the 60s again, too, right? This is, I mean, the the sexuality was was being discovered in a way. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, And it was only in 1970 that the issue of abortion entered my consciousness because two physicians whom I knew opened an abortion clinic when the law changed in New York and asked me if I was willing to run the clinic, and I said yes. Hmm. And and so that was my first exposure to the abortion issue, was dealing with women who faced what for them were deeply— difficult situations in pregnancy, who were suffering very much from a pregnancy that carried with it all sorts of problems for them. So that that was my first experience. And my sympathy, I guess my sympathy always from mother forward has been um, for women. So I'd like to talk about your perspective, your experiences and your perspective across this sweep of time about what goes wrong in our culture, as mm-hmm. we try to navigate this issue of abortion, mm-hmm. um, you know, where would you start to talk about that? I think that, um, first of all, I think I always had an approach to abortion that was somewhat different from that of the mainstream choice movement, mm-hmm. uh, in that politics never interested me very much. You know, the idea that abortion was about getting the right people elected. You know, the idea that there were extremists on the side of those opposed to abortion and um, rational people on the side of choice uh, never quite fit for me completely. Mm -hmm. I think that since I did this work as a Catholic, even though many Catholic venues were closed... I probably talked to more people over the years who were opposed to abortion than most folks in the choice movement. Mm -hmm. And while I certainly think there is a twin absolutism between those who think there is only one value at stake, the value of women's identity and rights, or on the opposite side of the spectrum, the value of the fetus, that For most people, including me, both of those values exist, and the abortion issue is one in which one mediates those values and others. So let me me ask you this way. I mean, for example, a couple of years ago, I moderated a a discussion between three generations of evangelicals. Uh And one of them was Chuck Colson at the elder end and also at the most conservative end. And then there was somebody there who was, I think he would call himself a socially progressive evangelical, and there was someone who's part of the new monastics movement. So it's kind of this spiritual renewal movement that is evangelical, but kind of out on the edges, like monasticism and Catholicism has always been. And um, what was interesting is that they held very different theologies on all of this. Abortion was something that on one hand they all, I think, agreed as a sin, but mm-hmm. then they went to very divergent places about what that meant, right? So for Charles Colson, it did mean that you would you would look to elected officials as part of what Christians should be about. Um, mm-hmm. For one of them, uh, who was a pastor, he felt that abortion was a sin, but felt that poverty is often at the root of abortion and so that if a church mm-hmm. wants to work, you know, that it should be working on behalf of women and not right. necessarily electing pro-life candidates. So, right. so, but one thing I asked them, and I don't really think I got a satisfying answer to it, I'd like to ask you is, why do you think it is that this issue 
has become such a lightning rod. And it's often put together with issues of or other issues around sexuality, or, you know, gay marriage. Right. But that one is moving. Right. And abortion is the one that is um, where everybody, you know, at least in, in our public dialogue, is everybody's in the trenches and um, it's hard to see any way forward, at least just reading newspapers. So right. what, is, what is it about this issue that, that makes it so difficult and so important? Mm. Well, I think there are many things uh, about it that have uh, lent to the kind of intransigence or intractability that abortion has become in our society. Mm -hmm. I, I think, first of all, I think, okay, some people would disagree with me about this on the choice side. Abortion in and of itself is not a positive good, okay? It has positive outcomes. It may indeed often be necessary. But unlike, say, homosexuality, in which what you are dealing with for most people, is the positiveness of human relationship, partnership, love, Mm -hmm. um, all of those good things that some people think people of the same sex shouldn't enjoy, but nobody questions that those are goods. Mm -hmm. In the case of abortion, you are dealing always with the destruction of life. It may not be life that has, that is personal. It may not be of the highest value. Uh, it doesn't, in my opinion, have rights. But I think, particularly as time has passed, we are all striving to create a world, or most of us are striving to create a world in which life, in all its forms is fostered and nurtured. Mm -hmm. And abortion, in some ways, goes against that. So if you have a kind of absolutism, you know, if, if you don't contextualize it, and you just look at it, even if you're not looking at it as murder or killing, you know, in, in the grossest terms, mm-hmm. but simply as the interruption of life processes that we would prefer under other circumstances go forward, it always has a dimension of loss to it. And so that's very difficult to deal with in political contexts, which is how we deal with it. So I think that's part of it. And what is it about the political context that makes that? It, it, it removes the possibility of context, does it? I mean, it right. turns everything right. into a it's vote. So- that's right. Something is either legal or illegal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's either legal or illegal. Mm-hmm. And that's a very difficult way of dealing with, I mean, it's the same thing with, you know, end of life issues or uh, many other issues that we deal with that are moral and ethical issues, health care issues in our society. It's very difficult to reduce them mm-hmm. to yes or no. And I think in that sense, both movements you know, the choice movement and the life movement, and I'll use life for the purpose of Mm -hmm. uh, graciousness, have so focused on an absolute yes or no perspective to this that the context gets very, very, very lost. And the other thing I would say is, the other difference is that abortion is something that enters a person's life at a specific moment and leaves it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Homosexuality is part of one's daily identity. Right. And so the need to find a place in the world in which the totality of their lives is accepted is much stronger. Mm -hmm. And for most people, most of us don't want to think about abortion. And even women who have abortions don't want to think about abortion all of the time. They don't make abortion, for the most part, a defining part of who they are and their identity.
I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, returning to wisdom beyond the news cycle, my 2011 conversation with longtime abortion activist and more recent bridge person, Francis Kissling. So I'm I'm really aware that you and I uh, are talking as though there are two sides to this issue, which is how we talk about it in our public life. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's pro-life and pro-choice. I, I, I remember, though, being so struck by hearing about the uh, uh, results of that same poll out of the 2004 election where we got the yep. God gap, <laughs> yep. where yep. it showed this moral values gulf. But hearing that in that same poll, a majority of people who had voted, a majority, including Democrats and Republicans, came out for abortion with some limits. But I know that you're steeped in this, and, and I, I'm aware of some of it, too. What the research says when there's any nuance to it is that, in fact, there is a broad consensus in the middle of that. Lots of details to be worked out. But, but, yes. but <laughs> let's talk about that, what you know yeah. about where we are collectively as a nation with this. Okay. First of all, I think that 2004 in some ways was, for me and I think for this issue, a moment of great sea change. And that... Um, you know, it was what the popular word now is it was a game changer. Right. <laughs> um, so, but I think that not too many people have recognized that no. it, was a, it was a game changer. And so nobody's playing in this new field, you know, that, <laughs> that the sides still remain mostly ossified. So I'll just put that on the table. And I'm, I'm trying to be different than that, for yes. whatever, whether it's better or worse. But at any rate, that's what, where I am. And I think that what became evident at that point was, first of all, on the side of those who have been opposed to legal abortion and who see it as very immoral, essentially immoral, but who are religious and progressive on many, many other issues, they realized that they had to change on abortion. Um, I think that they made the first move And that move uh, was the notion that, you know, and and a person like David Gashi, the evangelical, I think, is the example of the best version of this shift. Okay. It was the recognition that what we have been doing in being against abortion for the past 30 years has gotten us nowhere. And so we have to concentrate on getting the number of abortions down by other methods than illegality. I saw that as a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And by the same token, from the choice side, at least where I stand, it's also true that the political legal strategy hasn't really worked for us. Yes, abortion is still legal, but it is so much more restricted and particularly restricted for women at the margins, that the vision that we had about equality as part of access to abortion has eroded, not been achieved. You know, I want to read, this is a sentence you wrote. I just, I think it's really wonderfully clear and provocative. Um, Making babies is serious business and sex is a pleasurable and meaningful activity with social consequences. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, I actually think, you know, in this, this discussion about um, civil discourse, I think that there are multiple layers in having civil discourse. I'm actually finding it easier to have civil discourse with some people who are opposed to abortion than I am having civil discourse <laughs> Within my own movement. Yeah. Well, that's... <laughs> and I'm sure that's true for those who are opposed to abortion. You yes. know, the, the poor person on the side of those opposed to abortion who deviates from the absolutism of making it totally illegal mm-hmm. is very castigated by their movement. And they've got to fight, you know, they've been fighting over incrementalism versus absolutism, you know, for years. And now, you know, there is just the beginning on the choice side of the same kinds of discussions over, again, 
you know, sticking the line that abortion is, you know, largely an absolute right of women, or thinking about, as I put it, not so much thinking about restrictions, but thinking about ways in which we as pro-choice people can let the American public know that we think abortion is serious business. We think making babies is very serious, very serious responsibility. Mm. I, I think that's, you know, uh, the human condition and an irony of this moment we live in where pluralism is real and a lot of us are living into it, but some of our bitterest disagreements are with those who are closer to us, right? Well, it's always that way in the family. I mean, yes. all, of, the, all yes. of this is all of this is based, you know, ultimately, you know, people say family is the basic unit of society. <laughs> and I would have some disagreements with that. I think that yeah. the community is, but you know, it, these are all, these are all reflections of the dynamics between, you know, it's the same dynamic between a couple. Yeah. There is nothing worse than your partner disagreeing with you in public. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have a partner mm-hmm. and you and your partner, you believe something very deeply and your partner goes out and criticizes you in public or says something different. I mean, that is really, devastating. Yeah. Much more devastating than somebody who, you know, you already some, know you don't have anything in common already with. Already <laughs> you know you don't you think you have nothing in common yeah. with disagrees who cares? Yeah. You know, so, and so that's what we're struggling with in the in our movement. And I I want you to tell me about dialogues, conversations, approaches that that you have been part of that are mm-hmm. opening this up and that are very different from mm-hmm. this either or pro con politicized abortion discussion that we're used to. Um, what, mm-hmm. what stories would you want to tell people about how this conversation is unfolding? Well, first of all, I was very lucky in that uh, I met the people in the Public Conversations Project in the early 90s around a different conversation effort than the straight-out abortion one. I met them around a conversation that they organized that lasted for two years between feminists environmentalists and uh, population uh, and the population establishment, the oh, old line population control people. <laughs> and yeah. um, so I had the benefit of working with them in a group of 30 or 40 people who met, as I said, over a two year period to come to understand each other better. And so that was my first formal experience at, at dialogue. And um and it was a very successful dialogue, and people stuck with it. And it actually made changes in terms of, of how these three groups worked together at the policy level. I then became involved with them when they turned their attention to the abortion issue. Most strongly, they turned it at the time when um, there were the murders of abortion providers in Boston. And that was the mid, mid-90s, right? Mid '90s, mm-hmm. and one of the things they they I did with them was um, I asked if they would conduct a dialogue with me and one person who is pro-life, who I respected a great deal, a professor at Fordham University, who was a progressive Democrat, and um, we met with them for an entire day. We talked with each other for six hours in a facilitated discussion that was videotaped uh, for posterity Mm -hmm. um, and in which there were like six facilitators engaged in working with the two of us, one in the room and four or five behind the two-way mirror. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first, um, and, and it was a very profitable encounter. What I think is very important is I'm not a big believer in common ground. Let me be very frank about that. Uh, I think that common ground... You mean the notion of common ground, right? that, that the way we yeah. will resolve our disagreements is by yeah, finding yeah. our common ground. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I just think that it, it's just, you know, I mean, I think that common ground can be found between people who do not have deep, deep differences. Um, and in politics, you can find compromise. Compromise is the, politics is the art of the possible. But to think that you are going to take the National Conference of Catholic Bishops and the National Organization of Women and they are going to find common ground on abortion is, is not practical. It's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And we could extend that. But I do think that when people who disagree with each other come together with a goal of gaining a better understanding of why the other believes what they do, good things come of that. But the pressure of coming to agreement 
works against mm. really understanding each other. Mm. And we don't understand each other. And the polarization that exists on the abortion issue in which people have called each other names and demonized each other speaks against, um, it definitely speaks against any desire, any level of trust that enables people to, to come to some commonality. And so that you, you really have to start with this first idea that there are some people, not all, who see some benefit in learning why the other thinks the way that they do. And, um, you know, it's, it's some of it's the simplistic stuff of uh, humanization, that the person becomes a real person, not mm -hmm. just, not an extremist, mm -hmm. not a, a liar, mm -hmm. not evilly motivated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that perhaps for some people you can overcome the epithets that we have charged each other with. And that I'm a very strong believer in. I have learned, I have changed my views on some aspects of abortion based upon having a deeper understanding of the values and concerns of people who disagree with me. Hmm. And as a result, I have an interest in trying to find a way that I can honor some of their values without giving up mine. Hmm. That's, for me, what has happened. And that is, um, again, different from this rush that I think we have in this culture to this little say, kind of a, a, a parallel to finding common ground, getting on the same page, right? Right. <laughs> because right. you're not talking about getting on the same page. No, no. But, you know, it, it's uh, Sidney Callahan, who is against legal abortion, generally speaking, a uh, long time ago said that, you know, the hallmark of a civil debate is when you can acknowledge that which is good in the position of the person you disagree with. short break, more with Francis Kissling. We're putting all kinds of great and fun extras, poetry, music, and a new feature, Living the Questions, into our podcast feed. You can get it all as soon as it's released when you subscribe to On Being on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. On Being is brought to you by the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Foundation supports academic research and civil dialogue on the deepest, most perplexing questions facing humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? And where are we going? To learn more, please visit templeton.org. The Templeton Foundation. Stay curious. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, drawing on enduring wisdom beyond the turbulent news cycle, my 2011 conversation with Francis Kissling, the former longtime president of Catholics for Choice. We're drawing her out on her less famous adventures of recent years in new relationship and conversation with her political opposites. She is controversial and speaking from a place that many of us would like to map out between the polls on this and other fractious debates. I want to read you something that I was really struck by that you wrote. You were giving a list of a couple of qualities um, that you thought were necessary if we, as you said, if we are to continue the conversation to bring constructive right. forward-thinking appro forward approaches to what has been a long and difficult issue. One of them that really struck me was the courage to be vulnerable in front yes. of those we passionately disagree with. Right. Right. And I think that's the hardest thing to do. And I think it is very hard for all of us in these situations to acknowledge, for example, that we just don't have the answers to this problem. I don't think we have the answers to the problem of abortion in our society, or whether it's the problem of abortion itself or the problem of how we're going to mediate our differences about abortion. And a willingness to admit that is very, very difficult. Um, 
what is it in your own position that gives you trouble? Mm. What is it in the position of the other that you are attracted to? Where do you have doubts? Because it is only, I think, when we, if, if we are interested in understanding each other, and if we are ultimately interested, and it's not a question of common ground, but if we are ultimately interested in an abortion policy that reflects what is good in the concerns of those who disagree, the only way we're going to get any sense of what that is, is if we can acknowledge what is good in the position of the other, acknowledge what troubles us about our own position. I mean, I, I, I've said this to somebody recently. I said, you know, I don't understand how you can work on an issue for 35 years as complicated as this and never change your mind mm. at all about anything. But don't you think also, that, again, you know, the, the whole context, the whole ambience of our public hand-wringing over these intimate issues that get at our sexuality and our core mm-hmm. identity, right? There's yeah. so much fear. It's an atmosphere yes. of fear. Yes. And, I mean, it, it is precisely in an atmosphere of fear where people don't feel safe, where they don't feel... Um, yeah, where they don't feel safe enough. You, you have to be, yes. feel safe enough to show vulnerability, right? To express well, but doubts. You know, see, let me say, let me say, I think, I think, yeah, that's one thing. That's one aspect of this. But there are some others. What we've been doing hasn't been working. Now, maybe some people think it's been working, but, and I think that that you become more willing to be vulnerable at a moment when you recognize that what you have done has not gotten you where you want to be. So there is that element of part of vulnerability is some modicum of helplessness. Mm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if you don't think you need any help and you think everything is just hunky-dory, well, then there's absolutely no reason to be vulnerable. Most of us, when we... And and I think that the, the fascinating thing, at least for those of us who are you know, on the choice side, which tends to be more progressive and more liberal, we are the first people to criticize fear-based politics. Right, right. Right? Mm -hmm. So we can't operate from fear. Mm. Some people have to step forward and not, you know, it was Pope John Paul II's motto on his crest, be not afraid, you know? Mm. (laughs) And so, and that's the story. We be not afraid. You know, it, again, you know, to pull this into a religious context, this is what we, I mean, the things about Catholicism that I think stick with me are, first of all, nobody ever told me being a Catholic or being engaged in public life um, was a popularity contest. <laughs> you know, Christians are not called to be popular. <laughs> And so you kind of, you know, so a lot of that stuff is in me in one way or another. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we're called to speak the truth with humility, okay, with humility, because the truth, we may not be right, but we're called to say what we think. And if it's popular one week, very nice. And if it isn't, well, that's that's the way it goes. Mm. And so I think that, you know, there is some need to be for some people and some people on both sides of the abortion equation, more often than not, people with either religious backgrounds or in the religious community have decided that they are willing to be unpopular hmm. with their own community. And I don't say that as any kind of martyr. You know, I mean, I'm, the, I'm by no means a martyr. And, I you know, it's like, oh, woe is me. I have no sense of woe, woe is me. I have a great life. Um but, but I think that, you know, you, you can't be motivated completely by a desire um, to have the choir singing your praises. Right. <laughs> um, I want to I test something out on you. I've been, okay. This is an idea I've had. That, again, these issues, like, they're, they're so different in many ways, but say abortion and gay marriage, let's say those are the two lightning rod issues. Right. What binds them is that they're both about these intimate sexual aspects of life. Um, right. And it, it, it strikes me that um, there are people on all sides of these issues who are literally caught in them, right? The pregnant women, 
and on the pro-life side, someone would say the innocent unborn child, right? Right. Um, but, you know, you are someone, you've become, I don't know what somebody's called you, the philosopher of the Alan pro-choice Goodman. movement. And what did I yeah. say? Someone else called you the abortion queen. All right. Right. And the cardinal of choice. I Card- Cardinal of choice. Okay. Yeah. So, but you, again, are someone who you've never married. You don't have children of your own. It's, there's, and I... I feel like in these issues, these things are painful and personal for so many people. Yes. And that there's a role for, you know, what people I see like you as a, for bridge people who aren't um, personally caught in that trauma Mm -hmm. and yet can be a voice. Um, Yes, I guess so. And I I think that that's, uh, if that's true, then it's important to raise that up, to point at it. Because that suggests a role for all kinds of people in our culture who may not feel like they are, want to be issues-based, but do care about the fabric of our common life. Right. Although I would, I would just say that, that the fact that I've never been married and I've never wanted children and I've never had children does not mean that I haven't been sexual. Mm-hmm. And so as a woman who was, I'm now 67 years old, so fertility is no longer a question. Mm. Um, but, you know, for many years I was fertile. And so the potential of becoming pregnant um, was in my life. And I think that that it has a profound effect. I mean, probably a more profound effect on me um, than it might have had on a person who wanted children Mm -hmm. and who had a vision of their own life as uh, bound in a more conventional uh, marriage, family, etc. It was very important for me not to become pregnant. Mm-hmm. More important, I think, than f- for women like me, I think it is was really, really critical. And um, I think that, you know, again, I want to go back, although it's not quite the topic we're on, to this whole question of the seriousness of the power and responsibility that women have as life givers. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being, today with Frances Kissling. So I want to ask you also, you have been struggling with kidney disease. Now, I've yes, read a right. few things that you knew that. over the last few years. <laughs> Do you have a donor? I've been reading about your... <laughs> Did that happen? Well, my, kid, my kidneys have, um, have uh, continued... My kids, as I call them. Okay. <laughs> How are your kids, people yeah. ask me. Uh, um, my kids have been behaving well, and so I have not... Uh, you know, I have not yet had to even cross the threshold of, you know, getting a donor finally approved. You know, what what I what occurs to me is I wondered how this experience yes. has flowed into all the thinking you've done and all the passion you've put all these years towards thinking about our bodies as yes. at once private and public. <laughs> yes. Yes. And the concept of donation, the concept. I mean, I'm fat. It, it really extended my consciousness around the notion, the, the, the whole idea of the gift of life. Mm. Um, mm. And I have written a little bit about the relationship between someone giving a part of their body to me. And that, you know, it's, it's like, oh, this is so terrible. Um, it's sort of like communion. Okay? Mm. That a part of someone else's body is going to be in me for the rest of my life. And a foreign part that I am going to have to work through drugs for my body not to reject it. These are very um, interesting philosophical uh, reflections that I've made. Also, for example, when somebody gives a kidney, um, we applaud that person as the most altruistic of human beings. But women give their bodies every day to a fetus to bring it into the world. 
And every pregnancy carries with it the risk of death. Pregnancy is normal. Having babies is normal. It's natural. It's no big deal that women do this. It is a big deal that women give their bodies to bringing new life into the world. You know, I've always thought that if we were really talking about this theologically as opposed mm-hmm. to politically, yeah. we would have to speak in terms of gifts rather than rights. I mean, rights exactly. is a concept that's foreign to the Bible, but gift, but choice and life right, are right. gifts. Right. Um, what do you think you've learned uh, about how social change happens? Like, what, what would progress look like now in these years ahead of you? With, well, with your own kidneys or with other people's <laughs> kidneys? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's a very, that's a very difficult question. Um, what have I learned? I, I guess, really, I mean, it's something I learned when I left Catholics for Choice three years ago, and I was lucky enough to get a fellowship to go to Harvard at the Radcliffe Institute. I learned a great deal there about how we learn and how we communicate with each other. It was, it was really a remarkable experience and that uh, the need to approach others positively and um, with enthusiasm for difference <laughs> um, is absolutely critical to any change. There is no way to change somebody. I mean, I'm not, you know, like I'm the toughest of fighters. Let's, let's be very clear. I mean, my reputation, you know, for being devastating um, in debate is legendary. <laughs> but, and, and, you know, and I love a good fight, but I, and I love to win. Okay. <laughs> but I think that what I have learned is that you know, the, the simplistic way of putting it is that you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's a very wise saying. But I have learned that change really... First of all, I think change comes about at the margins. I've always believed that. People in the center are not going to be the big change makers. You've got to put yourself at the margins um, and be willing to risk in order to make change. But that more importantly, you have got to approach differences, as I said, with this notion that there is good in the other. It's just, it, that's it. And that if we can't figure out how to do that, and if we keep thinking, if both sides on the abortion, if there isn't the crack in the middle where there are some people on both sides who ref- absolutely refuse to see the other as evil, mm-hmm. um, this is going to continue. What I think is really emboldening to others, let's say to people who might be listening about what you just said, is thinking about change on the margins as opposed to the margins where you are marginalized, right? Because right. this model, this approach you're talking about, it really does fly in the face of the logic and the the etiquette of what happens in politics, what happens on TV talk shows. Um, but you're saying that still is, is where the pressure comes that makes its right. way. Right. And there's a lot of pressure to be that way. It's much easier to be that way. Mm-hmm. It's much easier. It's much easier to, you know, like, uh, you know, it's again, it's it, it's the preaching to the choir versus, you know, listening to people who disagree with you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the choir is already there. You know, the choir doesn't need us. <laughs> Frances Kissling is president of the Center for Health, Ethics, and Social Policy. She was president of Catholics for Choice from 1982 until 2007. This interview is part of On Being's Civil Conversations Project, our resource for creating new spaces for reframed conversation and relationship. I had an opportunity to experience some of the tools Frances Kissling just offered up. Her questions that have a power to break out of what feels like intractable polarization. I brought her into conversation with the Christian ethicist David Gushy. He is associated with the pro-life spectrum of the abortion debate. What is it in your own position that gives you trouble? What is it in the position of the other that you're attracted to? One of the things I'm attracted to um, and have 
really learned a lot from in dialogue with Francis and others in the pro-choice community is the sustained knowledgeable commitment to the well-being of women. And um, this issue, no progress can be made on it without that commitment. And many on the pro-life side, especially the most visible folks, they have a tin ear there. They just don't just just don't sense that it's there. Well, one kind, I mean, one kind of help is offered in a certain kind of crisis pregnancy center, but but the broader, more holistic, getting deep into the realities of women's lives globally, the global perspective really is important too, as well as domestically, I think is important. Um, a concern I have uh, about my own side, what the main activists in the pro-life or anti-abortion community want is an overturn of Roe versus Wade. I am not at all convinced that if that were to actually happen that they would like the world that they would see on the other side because I'm not sure that it would lead to fewer abortions. I think it might lead to, to more. Um, if especially uh, there was a shredding of the social safety net at the same time. So I say to my side, if, if, you, if you're all about five Supreme Court justices overturning Roe v. Wade, you better be all about being in dialogue with everyone who knows about why women seek abortions and are addressing the prevention side and addressing the support for women's side. And in general, that's not where the activists on the pro-life side are to be found. And so I'm you know, deeply worried about that, deeply conflicted about okay. that. So Francis, what is it in your own position that gives you trouble? What is it in the position of the other that you are attracted to? Well, I think what I'm troubled by in terms of, uh, though, though generally speaking, those who support both the legal and the moral right to abortion, um, which I think is a good thing to support, um, I'm generally t troubled by the one value approach to the question, that the only value that needs to be considered in both moral decision making and in legality is what the woman wants. Okay. And that whatever the woman wants, no matter what difficulty, whatever difficult situation comes up that we talk about, um, abortion for sex selection, abortion very late in pregnancy, abortion of, of disabled fetuses. I mean, these to me are very, very complicated questions. And what I get back from my movement is if the woman wants an abortion, there is no other factor or value that should be considered. And it is, even though, even though I don't think fetuses have an absolute right to life, you know, I have a very different view of the fetus than David does, I think fetuses have value. And I don't think you can make the fetus invisible in the abortion decision. I, th I think abortion decision is a conflict value decision. Mm -hmm. What I like about the position of people who, who are very strongly opposed to legal abortion it is it, that side of that movement that really is troubled, it, that really is, it does have what David calls the, a consistent ethic of life. I, I could rip it apart, you know, if I was in one of my wind moods, but, but I think that that notion that, that, that there is a holistic um, need for respecting life and life processes is very attractive. And, and I think the arguments that are made about um, wanting to expand our sense of who is part of our community is a very attractive argument. That's a good thing. Francis Kissling and David Gushy. You can always listen to the rest of that conversation and find many more resources at civilconversationsproject.org.
On Being is Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Maya Tarrell, Marie Sambalay, Aaron Farrell, Lauren Dordal, Tony Liu, Bethany Iverson, Aaron Colasacco, Kristen Lynn, Prophet Adewu, Casper Tech Kyle, Angie Thurston, Sue Phillips, Eddie Gonzalez, Lillian Vo, Lucas Johnson, and Damon Lee. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. And the last voice you hear singing our final credits in each show is hip-hop artist Lizzo. On Being was created at American Public Media. Our funding partners include the George Family Foundation, in support of the Civil Conversations Project, the Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, working to create a future where universal spiritual values form the foundation of how we care for our common home. Humanity United, advancing human dignity at home and around the world. Find out more at humanityunited.org, part of the Omidyar Group. The Henry Luce Foundation, in support of public theology reimagined. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. And the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is a Krista Tippett public production. Ah.